All right, everyone, welcome to the Talk Lab podcast. Thank you for clicking on this episode. And uh, if you haven't joined the Talk Lab podcast yet, I don't know what the heck you're doing. It's uh, season two right now. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Click that subscribe button and, uh, you know, check us on other platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Angami, and Spotify. And if you want to check our social media, feel free. Links are in this, the description. Today with me, I've got a dear friend and such an inspiring story, Brandon Peacock. How's it going, bro? <laughs> going good, man. Thanks for having me on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. Um, just to hit it off, you know, from the top, um, what the heck were you thinking? <laughs> like, <laughs> when, like, literally, you, you it took be... you a year between getting shot to yeah. running a marathon, which we will get on later on uh, this podcast. But uh, that's literally my... F- that was literally my first question when I met you originally. Yeah. I was like, what the heck is this guy? Was this guy thinking running a marathon after a year of, after a year of getting shot? Like it is, it is something such an inspiring story. And, uh, I'm just going to come clear here. Um, it did inspire me, uh, at the time that I met you, I was, I had stopped going to the gym and like not doing anything, uh, for pretty much like four or five months. And then I met you and I was like, no, I, I got to do something. <laughs> so a week later, I ran two kilometers, which was nothing. But, uh, Dude, you know, I got back into still, it. It's, it's, it. It takes time to build up. It, that's exactly. great. Just getting out there is the first step. Right? Exactly. So to be honest with you, first of all, thank you very much <laughs> Dude, hey, for inspiring me and others. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I think that's like, for me personally, it's it's never really the goal, I, I think. But it's a, it's a really, really nice thing that comes out of doing some of the stuff that I've been doing. And I, I think that's fantastic. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear that that inspired you. Thank and, you. <laughs> uh, you know, all of you guys kind of inspired me by rallying around me too, right? In so many different ways. Like, I know we, I talked about it on Deep Show, but like seeing what you're doing, taking your Saturdays, filming podcasts, trying to grow your own business, your own network, that kind of stuff. That inspires me just as much as, you know, me running my marathon might inspire you. So seriously. I, I love what you're doing here. <laughs> Thank you very much, man. Well, you know, let's get into it. Okay. <laughs> let's get let's get into it. So uh um about a year ago you did get shot in Ottawa. Three times. Three times. God <laughs> damn it. And just to say it again, in Ottawa, yeah. <laughs> the most boring place on earth. You, you, you the, never think it's gonna happen here. <laughs> dude, it's the last place that I would think that would happen. Like it's not yeah. like as we were talking previously about like shit that goes on in the middle east Mm -hmm. that's where i expect uh, this shit to happen you know what i mean like if someone dies in the middle east well they died in the middle east like we know shit happens there but ottawa man (laughs) yeah still tragic but (laughs) it is very actually yeah and uh yeah you know i'm just gonna ask uh the question that everyone do ask like even though i know but uh what did you do (laughs) yeah so why did you get shot man (laughs) yeah um Basically what happened, as you can see, my hair is, is pretty long right now. So I was going in to, to get a haircut right after work, 5.45 p.m., like, you know, middle, it's bright outside, it's June. Um, and walking into my barber shop, a car pulls up and opens fire on the shop. Um, I happen to be the back of three people running inside. I guess one of those three happened to be the target of the shooting. He saw everything coming and got out of the way first, um, naturally, because he was aware of the situation before us. Um, the second was the owner's wife who was holding the door open for me because of COVID protocols, right? Um, and then I happened to be really close to the third, like a, to the second, third, I guess. I, I kind of like let Annie, who was holding the door open for me, get in front of me and then launch the two of us like inside, right? Um, and again, my memory is a little foggy on this. This is just kind of like the way she explained it to me after watching some of the camera footage, I guess, which oh uh, I haven't watched, so I can't corroborate, but I, I'd like to think that that's the truth. <laughs> oh my. Um, but yeah, just kind of got caught up in the middle of not even crossfire, just one-sided shooting, open fire in the barber shop. I took three of the four bullets. I think the target got hit once. I, I'm not entirely sure, but again, I think that's just, that's what I was told the night of. So um, I believe they got him maybe once, but they did a pretty bad job of getting him considering they got me three <laughs> times. Um, I took one in the chest, which um. at the time of the shooting was by far my biggest concern, like bullet hole right, you know, my, the heart side of my chest. Um, right by my lungs obviously was a massive concern i was bleeding pretty good from there and then i took one in the left leg which happened to be not too big of a deal and then, and then one in the right leg. yeah one in the right leg that hit my femoral artery which not a good spot to get shot um, no <laughs> i i think um 
the blood, like I, I bled out so quick. Like I was sitting in basically like a pool of my own blood. Um, I just found this out actually kind of recently. I don't even know if I've talked about it on any of the podcasts, but um, I like I have talked about the fact that I called my mom the night of. Why I called my mom is because Annie, who was with me the whole time, was kind of like, you know, compressing my leg. I was compressing my chest and she runs over, like grabs the phone and is like, do you want to call anyone? And at that point I was like, yeah, I probably should. Like, I, I don't think I'm going to die, but I'm like, you know, yeah, it'd probably be good to like let someone know that like they should maybe meet me at the hospital or whatever. Um, and it was more so to let, I called my mom to let her know that I was like, Hey mom, I'm okay. Like, it's going to sound crazy. I got shot. I love you. Don't worry about it. Um, but she gave me the phone cause she's like, this kid's dead. There's no way he's oh coming, you know, coming back tomorrow morning. He's, he's toast. Um, fortunately that wasn't the case uh, as you know, you can see that I'm here right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was definitely a, a pretty spooky night in a lot of ways, but in the same time, I never took it like that, um, mm -hmm. which was really cool. I was really fortunate. My, my mom was at my cottage um, at the time and she couldn't make it. They only let one person come to the hospital um, because of COVID protocols and yes. they weren't even supposed to let any, but my dad, like given the severity of the injuries, like they closed off a whole floor for me. They're like, okay, like one person can come visit. So they wouldn't let my mom in or any of my siblings, but my dad got to come the night of. And he was amazing at keeping me, I think, sane the night of. We, we didn't mm -hmm. talk too much. Um, definitely not as much as you would expect. But the words that he kind of like put forward to me were, were really inspiring. You know, like I, I was in pain. I was definitely a little confused. I think I had a pretty good uh, sense of, you know, the situation. And I was very optimistic. Like at no point, like I said, did I think I was going to die personally. Um, even though I know the doctors had definitely... I think they put me at like a 50-50 survival rate and they said even if I did survive, like the chances of me keeping my leg were pretty low um, because, you know, they, because of the you, you, because, of injury, yeah. yeah, well, it's like the blood's like going there like crazy. It's, yeah, they did like a massive fasciotomy on both sides and anyways, they saved my leg, which is great. A yeah. testament to the amazing medical team that we have there at the Ottawa Civic. Um, but yeah, I remember the, the one thing that stuck with me and I think I've talked about this and I, I'm doing a, a speech with Carlton um, in January and it was one of the things that came to my mind first was um, my dad, the, maybe the second thing he said to me in the hospital, I looked at him and I was just like, man, it's starting to hurt, right? Like the adrenaline's wearing off, like reality's setting in. Mm -hmm. Now I've got these kind of, not doubts, but I'm definitely, they're, they're starting to creep into my mind a little bit. Exactly. Um, he just looks at me, he's like, that's great news. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? That's great news. I just told you I'm in a lot of pain now. He's like, you got pain that means you still got your leg buddy and i hear that and i'm like everything after that didn't matter there was no like it was i'm gonna be okay there was no more doubt there was no more self-pity there was no more feeling sorry for what had happened it was like you know what you're right the perspective entirely shifted and i don't know it, it was one of the, it, it was the craziest night of my life i i wouldn't say it was the most pain i've ever experienced <laughs> in my entire life because the adrenaline was high rehab was really hard um, there's a lot running my marathon was really painful as well. Um, but it was definitely the craziest experience I've ever personally been a part of. And I, you know, I, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but, uh, Hopefully not. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it was definitely a, a unique situation for sure that, that, you know, shaped my entire future. So I, I think about it all the time. It's still very fresh on my mind, but, um, I'm really fortunate that everyone involved that night, like Annie first on scene, you know, applying pressure to my wounds the cop that got there was there in four minutes had he been four minutes and 30 seconds i was dead um oh God, i was yeah. told like they got a tourniquet on my leg right away stopped the bleed out threw me in an ambulance as quick as i could i was at the hospital 25 minutes after everything happened um, maybe even sooner in surgery two hours later and fortunate to wake up um after an, i think an eight eight and a half hour surgery um, so amazing, you know, amazing medical team, amazing paramedics, amazing police officers on scene. Everybody did their jobs, right? Exactly. And that's when people talk about, they're like, it's wrong place, wrong time. Like, I, I feel so sorry for you, all this stuff. It's like, don't feel sorry for me. Feel happy for me. Right. Like, like I'm alive I, now. <laughs> yeah, I had one shitty, shitty situation. And then I had 10 more amazing things happen that yes. night that allowed me to preserve a, you know, I think a really good quality of life that I still have now, even with some long-term kind of ramifications everything else went right and I, I think you could focus on the negatives of that night and, and yes. dwell on them and let them kind of ruin your life or you can sit back and take that perspective my dad instilled in me right away and realize like you know it could be a hell of a lot worse <laughs> right um and just kind of be happy that you've 
happy for all the blessings and, and the good that really came out of it. So yeah, exactly. that, that's kind of like a, a synopsis of the situation. There's so much more stuff and I'm sure we'll get into it, but that's like yep, a bit course. of an overview of the night of what my feelings were like the night of and you know, everything that kind of immediately came to mind for me. Dude, you're hitting, you're hitting the right, the right points that I actually want to talk about. And, uh, mainly at first I want to talk about how difficult it was for your parents to, to deal with that. Cause like, you know, I mean, I can, I can relate to my parents and how protective they are of me. Yep. Um, if, if that actually happens or if they get like anywhere close to that call, mm -hmm. they would lose their minds. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's not an easy call to receive randomly. You know, you're just, you, your son just got shot. You know what I mean? It's just not yeah. an easy thing. I would rather I be, <laughs> to, I would rather be in the, my position than my parents' position. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've thought about that a lot and I, I don't even think it's close. Um, like for me, at least the night of, even if I had died that night of, I was in control in every way that I could be. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I was, I was, I knew how I was feeling at every second. I knew where my responses were at. Um, you know, I, I was present for all of it. Whereas my parents, there's so much uncertainty, right? Like my dad got right. to see me for one hour, whatever it was, um, not that long before surgery. My mom didn't even get to see me other than that phone call where we couldn't even really reciprocate conversation. It was just me saying, Hey mom, I got shot. Don't, don't worry about it. I'm going to be okay. But like, I wanted you to hear from me. Um, and the police like took the phone cause obviously they don't know who I'm calling, what I'm doing. Exactly. Um, you know, it's the right decision from them, of course. Um, but I think it's so much scarier and it wasn't just the night of, but it was the entire recovery process. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, again, I knew that had I had the opportunity to bounce back, I was going to take it and I was going to do every single thing I possibly could to get there. Um, and they, they have no idea, right? Like they're not in my head. They're not, no. they don't know how my body feels. They don't know all that stuff. There's just so much uncertainty and they obviously care about me more, more than anyone in the world. Right. Exactly. Um, Plus with, with what doctors were telling them about like yeah. the 50% chance of you surviving that, yeah. that must've been very difficult. Well, and what's crazy is they didn't even like, so when I came out of my surgery, they didn't even like immediately call my parents. So like my parents actually found out that I was alive. Not just like that the surgery was completed, but the fact that I was alive probably like two or three hours after my surgery was done and I was in stable condition. And because it was ga like gang related, they couldn't call in and get any information because my name was blocked off. Right. Exactly. Um, so they couldn't figure anything out. And my mom happened to be friends with one of the nurses at the Civic and she went to come check on me and they were like, you can't come in. And she's like, I'm coming in to check. <laughs> like, you know, this, you know, my friend, her kid might be dead. <laughs> I like, I need to go figure this out. Right. And anyways, they, they were able to figure it out, but I, I can't imagine how difficult those moments must've been for my parents. I know I've talked about, you know, what it was like, but I, I would much rather be in my position than their position where there's so much uncertainty. You don't know, like, at least when I closed my eyes to go into surgery, I was kind of at peace with like, maybe yeah. I won't wake up. I've done everything I can. Now it's in someone else's control. Exactly. And I'm I'm out, right? And it's painless, you know what I mean? Exactly. Like you're just yeah. sleeping and it just yeah. goes out peacefully. Whereas they're present and they have no idea and it's all they can think about and consume. And they've, you know, they've raised me for 23 years at that point. Yeah. What's like they don't know. They don't know what's next, right? Um, so I, I can't imagine how difficult it was for them. But what I will say is I was so unbelievably fortunate to have them throughout every facet of my recovery, right? Um, they basically dropped everything for me, especially in July and August. And like, I was their not just their priority one, but their only priority, you know, like Amazing. my dad took the two months off work and, and drove me to physio. Like I, I, I live in Canada. He yeah. drove me to, you know, um, the East end, like far, probably 35 minutes from Canada every single day, waited for three to five hours for me to finish my physio sessions and then drove me home and every day, right. That's six to six to eight hours out of his day every day just to, to wait for me. Right. Um, exactly. and he did it with a big smile on his face. So happy. Um, just happy that I was still present. Right. And my mom, you know, cooked, did, did you know, took care of me, got everything I needed was taken care of. They just kind of, you know, they, they were so selfless in that time that there was no, like, how can I be happy? It was, how do we make Brandon back to normal? Right. How do we get him back to normal? How do we make him content through all of these difficulties and without them like seriously things could have been a hell of a lot different so i i'm really fortunate but like i said i would 100 percent rather be in my shoes in that situation than theirs and it's, it's not even close 
amazing, bro. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you, like I I don't get it sometimes when people say that. Uh, Oh, I I actually hate my parents. I don't like them. I'm like, no, yeah. just keep just keep a good relationship with them, because yeah. when you fall down, mm-hmm. they're the first people to stand with you. Hundred percent, man. It's like, your your flesh and blood. Exactly. It doesn't it doesn't matter like how terrible the relationship was with them. Yeah. The moment you fall down, they're gonna be there. Well, it's funny, man. And like I I actually haven't talked about this too much. And so me and my brother, we we were like super super tight growing up. I I love the kid to death. Um, and we definitely drifted apart a little bit in our early twenties. And that's like, you know, there was no like resentment or anything. Like we were still family. I still love seeing the kid, but we just saw each other last. We were a little, you know, a little further apart than we ever really it, were. And I mean, then after happens. everything, everything came back, you know, it was like, there was no, like he, I, he was the first person I wanted to see after I could see my parents, you know, like, yeah, I would love to see him at the same time, obviously, <laughs> but he was like, you know, everything that you might ever have disagreed upon or every reason that you maybe drift apart seems so trivial exactly. when you go through something like that. And it, I think it brought us all a lot closer together as a, as a family and a collective. And in a weird way, like, like I said, there's so many reasons I'm thankful for what I went through. And that's one of them as well, right? I think how big it, how big of an impact it played in, in bringing our family back to the tight knit family we really were growing up. I thought it was really cool for sure. Exactly. Amazing, bro. And like when you woke up after the surgery in the hospital and uh, I like to talk about this stuff because I've spoken to other people who has been through trauma or been through surgeries. And uh, the biggest thing that I hear about is like how, um, oh my God, how they feel like that they're not in control. Like Mm -hmm. they can't like your body is just, you know, it's just something that you can't control. And it's just I I don't know like I can't I can't imagine that like being in that place to be honest yep. with you, um, especially if you're like if you're like a person who plays sports a lot and you know you're used to being like so strong, and all of a sudden you're just like hit with that weakness and you yep. can't like you think that the strongest thing that you had is that your biggest weakness right now. Yeah, ironically enough, like. Yeah, I so I dropped thirty pounds in in right. the hospital, um, like the day after. So I went in there, like my weight is usually around one ninety five, and I was I think I weighed in at about one sixty seven, um, the day after everything. So I was I was Shoot. definitely pretty weak, um, and I couldn't get out of my bed. So like I like when I say like, people are like, yeah, I broke my leg and I couldn't move, but like they could get up on crutches, whatever. Like I'm talking, yes. I was laying, you know, directly horizontal for probably eight days unable to move because all my ribs were broken i had a bullet hole in my i guess it kind of hit my like upper chest collarbone um and through my back like my lats so like fortunately it missed my it bruised my lung but like bruised lung whatever all things considered (laughs) exactly um ribs were all broken though so i couldn't really breathe too well i couldn't like move much up and down my right leg was demolished like completely destroyed so i couldn't walk and my left leg also had a bullet hole in it which seemed trivial because of the uh, injuries to the right leg right so um, I fully couldn't move whatsoever. And you definitely, I understand why you could feel like you're not in control of the situation because your body's so broken down. I took it and and I focused on what I could control. And I think that was something that gave me a lot of power in my recovery. Um, I basically made the conscious decision to start reading books, like work on my mental mm. strength throughout everything, right? Because that's the only thing I physically was capable of doing exactly. outside of sitting in bed and feeling sorry for myself, right? Yeah. And I needed a, an outlet. And for the first like two and a half days in the hospital, my outlet was taking the pain medication, falling asleep, sleeping 20 hours a day, feeling really sorry for myself. Not even, Not really feeling sorry for myself, but just like getting away, right? Like I I would sleep and in my dreams, like I was having crazy dreams at the time, which was just me Mm -hmm. like playing football with my (laughs) friends or like, you know, having two functional legs and like being a normal human being still. So I'd want to like escape, whatever. And then on like day three, I I basically was like, this is insane. This is a crazy way to live my life. I get that you can't move. And, you know, I get that you want to feel sorry for yourself, but you got to stop like opioids, whatever. It's not the way out. You need to start taking accountability, even though the situation is not your fault whatsoever. You need to understand it doesn't matter whose fault it was. You need to start focusing on your recovery and getting past it, right? Um, so like I said, I shifted to reading books. The first book I actually read 
Um, yeah, I don't know if you know Mike Majlak. He's like Logan mm-hmm. Paul's buddy. Yeah. Um, but he yeah, wrote a really, course. yeah, he, he wrote a really <laughs> good fan. book called The Fifth Vital. Yes. Um, talking, I don't know, have you read it? Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't read it. I know what the book is about. Okay. Yeah, about his recovery from actually yeah. drugs and uh, exactly. yeah, the use of drugs. Yes. So I think it was like a ski accident or something. He, yes. anyways, he was in the hospital, started taking opioids because of, you know, this, this injury he went through that was pretty painful. Mm-hmm. Um, and then became dependent on them. They shaped his entire life. They, they caused him a lot of problems and a lot of grief. And I read that book as the first book I read in the hospital because I wanted to reinforce that narrative in my mind. Like, you don't need this. This is a bad route to go. The pain is going to suck. You you know, like, you, you know, the pain is going to suck. But then it exactly. kept the, the words my dad kept telling me kept ringing through, right? Pain's good. Pain means you got feeling. Pain means you got a leg. Pain exactly. means you're alive. <laughs> Enjoy it, Right. Um, and I just kind of, I really focused on shifting the narrative and instead of worrying about, you know, my body and all these things that I, at the time couldn't really control, I focused on my mind and, and feeling better and being happier. And I think I did a really good job of that. And I think that made my recovery a hell of a lot better. Um, that, that kind of positive outlook that I took on it for sure. Interesting. And to be honest with you, like when it comes to this stuff, when it comes to trauma, um, the way I feel actually, um, or the most thing that helps is like when you have like the right environments around you and uh, when you have like the right people around you, actually, yeah. like we spoke about your family being the first, uh, the first people that were, you know, that were supporting you, but I believe as well, you had, like a lot of friends jumped in to so help. So many, yeah. Exactly. And like from the stories that I heard and from what I've read as well, your uh, your physiotherapist was actually yeah. your friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one so. of my best friends still to date. I consider the guy family now. Like he just, he went from being one of my closest friends to my my brother, right? Um, and I was so lucky. I, I think my friend group too. The, it's something. Sometimes they don't get talked about as much because of you know the family response right away and mm-hmm. you know Frank and and all that stuff. But my friends were amazing. Like they Facetime. They were gonna cancel their Canada Day plans because it was like two days before. They were so. distraught. And for me, like, you know, I just wanted them to, to have fun. Like I was going to be okay. There was no doubt in my mind. I didn't want to be someone who brought them all down. And I, I remember they kind of suggested like, we're going to get everyone together. It was, it was COVID. So it was also kind of like yes. yeah. frowned upon at this <laughs> point, but like they got like 40 or 50, like as many of our friends as we could that I had some sort of like strong connection with, got them together. And I remember I'm like, I'm pretty beat up in the hospital and I, I've got my iPad there. And I like FaceTimed into the party and like had an individual conversation with every single one of them. Um, felt like I was I was there. Like that was exactly. like my outlet, you know? Like I wasn't just like sitting in the hospital dead. I was basically out partying and having fun with my friends. And it was it was so amazing. And that's just like a testament to the people I have around me. Like everyone, there was no one who was like crying or sad. It was just like happy and smiles all around. And it, it was infectious, right? Um, and I tried to give off that attitude because I knew that it was going to be important in the the response that everyone around me took was was seeing me positive and happy and you know optimistic about exactly. everything but they did the same thing for me too so um I, I was so so unbelievably lucky man to have a group that i did i mean i love this mindset to be honest with you of like people being happy around you if whatever like happens yeah because like to be honest with you this is life yep. shit is gonna go wrong hell yeah man so you know, well, deal with it instead of just feeling sorry for yourself. Yeah. Well, I was I was reading. There's this book. Um, Oprah. It's Oprah came out with it. It's it's really recent. And and so like I I take these walks randomly. Like when I leave my apartment, I always end up at Chapters. It's my favorite place to go. Um, and I saw this book released by Oprah. It's called What Happened to You. And I'm like four chapters in right now. It talks about like trauma and all these different stories. Um, and one of the things she talks about, it's, it's more directed at like young children, mm-hmm. but the emotional response people take based on their environment. So what she talks about is like when babies are sad or whatever, like, you, you know, you play with them a little bit, you smile, like you laugh and, and they feed off that. Right. Exactly. And then their response becomes positive. And that was exactly what my situation was like. And I, I think that, you know, there's that happens with youth, but it also happens with us at an older generation. Right. Exactly. And I think with COVID, like people are a little more like scared to talk to people and right you're like a little more isolated now it makes such a big difference just like having a big smile on and going and and shooting the shit with somebody and brightening their day right so i had so many people in my life who did that for me i just tried to reciprocate it i mean even a facetime or like a skype call skype is dead yeah a zoom call (laughs) i don't don't know about skype Skype, (laughs) Skype. (laughs) why did i say skype (laughs) 
but yeah, no, it's so old right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, like uh, FaceTime, uh, I don't know, whatever you use, like what app you use to, yeah. to uh, kind of like mimic FaceTime, but yeah. uh, that that makes a lot of difference. It just feels that you like you care a lot, yep. to be honest with you. 100%, man. Everything is your environment. If your is friends it, are, are toxic and they're always, you know, talking behind your back or talking trash about people or, or just being negative, you, you just got to cut them, man. Like, I, I yeah. don't know that that's maybe like a, an it unfair, could be difficult to do it so, could be but difficult like, for sure. And I totally understand that. I I'm very fortunate. Like I said, yeah. I've got a very good friend group. I I've been fortunate mm -hmm. to, to come across people who I genuinely trust with my life. Exactly. Right. Um, and I know that's not as, as easy for some people for sure, but your friends should be the people who are uplifting you the most. Right. Exactly. And like, I, I think we've, even in this little kind of network that we've created, like where I've met you through, mm -hmm. there's so much positive influence and people are cheering each other on and, and wanting to help each other and help each other grow and be happy in life. And I, I think we need more of that. I really do. Exactly. Like actually like the first thing that pulled me to this network actually like is the smiles and the yeah. positive energy that flows around in this, like in this small network. Like it's not, yeah. it's not that big of a, uh, you know, of a group, but like yep. it is hell of a great one to be honest with you. Yeah. I love that. I love that energy that flows around. Like it's I try, I try, yeah, I try, I try to, you know, give as much positivity as I can, but I can be boring most of the time, which is very funny. I, I'm very similar, man. I, I, I feed off of the guy, the group around yeah, me big time. Exactly. I'm, I'm very much like you, I think, in that space. <laughs> exactly. Like you should see me like after after me and Deep, we shoot something and then at the end, I'm like just literally dead. Yeah. Like I can't say anything, but I try to be as, as positive as I can. But yeah. my replies are always late. Um, <laughs> it takes me a long time to say anything because yeah. like, like, hello, I was dealing with you three cameras. Gasped. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, very fair, man. Very fair. <laughs> but yeah, like, it's always, though, it's always great to deal with such people, to be honest with you. It just doesn't matter, like, how bad your day is. Yep. But once you meet those people, it just feels that all the problems in the world have yeah. been resolved. Like, A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, it's it's easy for you to get caught up in, I think, the chaos of the world. And, and everyone's going through their own unique struggles and difficulties. And, and I think what we've seen... A lot is a lot of people want to bring that negativity to to their friends and, and complain and and you know really bring down the other people around them and I, I think that there's maybe a, a time and a place for that for sure mm -hmm. like I, I think that having complaints with with the world is totally fine right exactly. um but I'd much rather talk to someone with a smile on their face who's not sitting here bitching about everything being against them but instead maybe putting a smile on their face and saying, how do we go about solving this problem? You know, yep. you, you flip that narrative, <laughs> right? And I think we found a pretty good group to do that. And like, I'm totally guilty in my own right for complaining about certain things and, and being, you know, grouchy and angry just as many people are. Um, but when you surround yourself with people who don't really take on that mindset, I think it makes you a much, much, much better person. Exactly. I mean, one thing's one thing that is funny is you joking about like, you're being shot. <laughs> Man, the, the first just... thing, are you, you a Call of Duty guy? You... <laughs> yeah, okay. So <laughs> the, the first thing I said in the hospital, and it's funny because like as soon as I got my phone back, um, I had a, like a lot of messages because people now started find, finding out before I had my phone because it was in evidence. Um, mm -hmm. And I got it back later that day and you know, I've got a ton of messages coming in. The first group I go to is like my little Call of Duty group that I have with like four <laughs> or five of my close friends. We play Call of Duty every night. It's, you know, it's COVID. Like this is our outlet, right? <laughs> um <laughs> And yeah, so basically I get a, like I go through the group chat. The last message there is like, they've been trying to get a hold of me for like an hour. And I, there's like, where's Peacock? All this, the last message there is, is, is Peacock dead question mark. <laughs> and they have no idea I've been shot. This is just like, you know, the boys humor, whatever. And then now they've found out there's no, there's been no responses in this group, but I've got individual texts from everybody. So people know. That's the first group I answer. I'm like, nah, boys, don't worry. I'm good. I had self revive. And that was the, <laughs> that was the first thing I said to like any friend group other than like one or two friends I'd FaceTimed. That was like the first message I typed out. And I thought it was the funniest thing in the world. And my buddies are like, you're sick, man. Like, what's wrong with you? But it was going to miss the headshot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't worry. He was, he was trash, man. <laughs> Dog water. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you know, I, I just like, I think it's taken a positive spin on everything and, and finding kind of the, the fun in it. And I, I think that went a long way to, to bringing peace to my friends and everyone around me too, right? Which was critical, critical, exactly. critical at that time. So 
there was one sentence that I actually like that actually I feel sums up your whole story that yeah. you said one time. Like if there's anyone to get shot in Ottawa, you are you are the most fit example or the, the most fit candidate. candidate. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I genuinely believe that. And I think that's why that's something that brought me a lot of peace was I, I know I, I talked about Annie at the start there. Had I not been there going to get a haircut, she's the one who got shot, right? And she's definitely shorter than I am. There's a good chance yep. the bullet that hits me in the chest hits her in the head, right? Mm -hmm. Um, she's got three wonderful daughters, you know, an amazing family. It could have been someone a lot worse, right? And for me, I had Frank, Frank who was on CERB during COVID, not working, who just graduated physio school waiting for his national exam. Um, so I was a full-time patient for him for free. Exactly. And he knew me better than anybody. So he pushed me so unbelievably hard. Um, and most physios wouldn't do that because, you know, they, they're scared of like, injuring the person or like making yeah. him upset whatever whereas frank was like i don't care if this hurts we're getting you back to 100 percent <laughs> as quick as possible and i just trusted him and it worked out really well for me um and i've got such a good network such a good exactly. family like it, I, I stand by that if there was a guy to get shot in the city <laughs> I, I think i was the best candidate um obviously i, I hope it didn't have to have to happen to anybody um, but if it was somebody I'm, I'm glad it was me exactly i mean like when it comes to physios they they try to not push you as much. I mean, because like they don't want they don't want to hurt you. They don't want you to you know come yeah. back. <laughs> well, it's crazy. So I was doing a once a week physio with an actual clinic mm -hmm. in Canada, and I would go in there on every like Wednesday or something for a one hour session. And he was diligent with like getting me out of there after an hour. Like I was oh taking up space if I wasn't in there. You know, if I was in there for more than an hour, um, and then it did nothing for me. Like it, it honestly like it almost made me regress. Like he's giving me exercises that I've been doing with Frank for three weeks. And he's like, okay, you've moved up to the bike. It's like, I've been doing the bike for three weeks. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what do you mean I've moved up to this? Like, why haven't we been doing this before? Um, and you could tell, like, he just, he didn't want to push me to a point where I was uncomfortable. He didn't want to make me not come back by, by hurting me or doing these extra things. Cause some people are a little more sensitive for sure. Um, Whereas for me, like I needed the opposite. I needed to be able to go in, do six hours of like intense workouts, leave there in extreme pain. Because like I, every time I left physio in the first two months, like I walked out much better than I walked in um, right. because you're, you're so much more limber. Like you, you've, you've got things in a pretty good place. But my nerve pain was so unbelievably bad the nights of that like I couldn't sleep. I was sleeping like an hour a night for probably a month and a half, two months. Um, I could not sleep and I didn't want to take any pain medication or opioids. So like I had my ly Lyrica, I think, which is like a nerve medication that kind of okay. helped ease the pain a little bit. But because I was working so unbelievably hard, it hurt so much, mm -hmm. but the blood flow was starting to come back, right? Which um, hurts more, by the way. <laughs> yeah, for sure it hurts more. Um, but, oh, 100%. It, but it made good pain, the nerves start regenerating a little exactly. bit quicker, right? Um, so I, I really pushed myself hard. Um, but again, it, it was, I found the right physios for me. And that's now, um, we'll talk, I'm sure we'll talk about this a bit later, but like through Hit the Ground Running, we're working with my boy, Ethan, exactly. who also got shot in the femoral artery, which is so unbelievably crazy to see another innocent kid in Canada have the same sort of thing happen. And I've got him in, I reached out to him when I found out I've got him in with my team, like not anyone else in the city. I know who I trust. They, they are the best people to get this done. He'll come in for his three-hour session, four-hour session, whatever, push himself to the brink, and he's getting so much better so much quicker, right? And it's it's really about finding the right team in your recovery, whatever that injury is, man. Like, I don't know if it, it could be anything. You could break your leg, tear your Achilles, like have any sort of life-altering injury, exactly. and you can sit there and go through the motions and do the easy route, <laughs> or you can work hard and put yourself in the hands of the right people, and, and they'll guide you to, you know, proper rehabilitation i can kind of relate like, i've said that before on on the podcast that yeah. like way way back then when i was like kind of 14 14 ish years old yeah i i kind of had like a funny enough i, I used to play basketball a little bit like yeah. for fun you know just not much i just got into it but then i had like a back injury which put me thinking like i wasn't doing any sports for like three years easily okay. like three years nothing when I was, you were 14 I, yeah, at so 14, 14 to 17, so, man, that sucks. The, exactly. The, <laughs> so like the best at, years to play sports. Literally. So at, at 17, I was uh, like, I would get off my bed mm -hmm. and I can feel like shitty pain in my back. Like, was that's it like the, nerve pain? 
I have no idea what was that pain. I think okay. it was just muscles being stiff or okay. something. But that's not the right pain to feel when you're 17. No, like, it's not. <laughs> like you're feeling a pain of like an 80 years old, yeah. to be honest with you. I spoke to a lot of people. They tried to push me to play sports and shit like that. I'm like, yep. no, I don't want to do it, whatever. And then for some reason, I have no idea why I got into Taekwondo. Okay. But I know I've got into it. That's yeah. that's what I know. Yeah. And like people ask me sometimes, like, oh, oh, you it must have been such a great story of like inspiring story that you got into Taekwondo. I'm like, I've got no idea why I got into it. I yeah. just know that, you know, it, it was my dad's friend that got me into it and okay. he made me actually try it once and I was yeah. like, Okay, what well, why not? You know, I kept pushing myself through it and you know it's a tough sport to get th- into. Exactly. Too, Thankfully, like I got my first black belt and I'm running for my second now. Okay. So don't mess with you. <laughs> Definitely. No. no i mean i mean it's it's not by the belt but it's it's actually it got me moving it got me back to like actual actually living my life yeah more healthy than it was before 100 percent. and to be honest with you like i stand by that like i i'm yep. proud of it and I'm, I'm glad i did that so that's why i can i kind of relate to your story it's not the same trauma of course not but Everyone it is something discounts it, it like is it's, something it's, it's all relevant Ser- <laughs> exactly. seriously and i, I think you're drawing a lot of parallels to what I went through yes. too, right? Like I, my entire landscape of the way I live has been shifted to focus on a more healthy lifestyle, right? And, and take care of my body a lot better than I would have had to before. And I think now I know there's a really good chance that it's almost guaranteed that I'm going to have some sort of like pretty bad arthritis in my right leg at some point. Like there's going to mm-hmm. be long-term issues for sure that I'm not seeing the impacts of as much right now that I will down the road. Um, especially with like, I've got really bad compartment syndrome in the right, oh like, the cor- like, you know, the bottom quadrant of my leg. Uh, my foot's pretty messed up sensitivity wise. And I've got some issues that are going to hit me a long time for sure. But now that I know that those are going to hit me, I have to, I'm forced to live my life a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. Right. And making sure I'm still like physically active is, is really important because if I start slacking off and being lazy, my foot hurts more, my leg hurts more, the blood's not flowing as well. Um, everything is tight. Like I need to be diligent with it. And almost going through that, it, it forces me to live a healthier lifestyle, which is honestly exactly. fantastic. Like I, I'm, I'm really, exactly. I'm happy about it. It's like, a, uh, I, I don't want to say like a, you know, benefit of everything. Cause like, it's still, I would have liked to have come to this without having to destroy my leg, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, in a weird way, it's a, it's a, it's a unique positive, I guess that, that you could say came out of it for sure. So like yeah. similar, you just have that, like, change of pace in your life and <laughs> exactly. you're, you're forced to to shift the way that you live and it's it creates a much better headspace i think for you exactly like it, it affects literally your mood the way you think yep. everything in your life kind of you start appreciating life more well I, yeah and i think what's something. crazy is like i so after i finished my marathon i kind of stopped like i was running like once a week twice a week like mm-hmm. going to the gym a couple of times a week but when i was in marathon prep i was working out five days a week and i was running four to five days a week, right? So like I was super, super, and that's like not including me having to go and do mobility training and like functional strength and all these like flexibility things. Um, And I missed it so much. When I finished the marathon, I got a little lazy. I started feeling like shit. And then I realized I'm like, this is crazy, right? Like I I can't just stop. So that's why in November, I'm like, I'm gonna do 200K this month running. That's like my my goal. I I wanna do 5K a day, 200K total, which should be easy. you know, all things considered, like it's not, uh, you know, it's no easy feat by some people's standards, but like, I definitely think I'm up to the challenge and I needed something to, to fuel myself and I feel so much better, right? Like if I'm having a shitty day, I get out there, I run. If I'm having a great day, I get out there, I run. Like it's just a little bit of consistency and stability in my life, I which is amazing. I think it's the idea of you keep keep on pushing, pushing yourself to like, to the limits. Yep. Like 40, man, like to be honest with you, <laughs> clap for you to be honest with you. Uh, 42k <laughs> you yeah. know what i mean i was like i was shocked to be honest i, I think like, i could have done eight more if i had to like i <laughs> like i but it, what i think was really unique about my situation is like i said i had a really good team around me running yes. which was amazing i also had a lot of people i was accountable to right so like i set myself up in a position where there was no way i was not finishing that marathon even if i had to die and crawl across the finish line right <laughs> Um, it, it, the only way I didn't finish is I was like face down at the bottom of the canal because I was just dead from trying so hard. Right. Um, and I, it, it was really good that I, I, I held myself accountable to so many people. I held myself accountable to myself, my core values, 
and it meant so much. I actually, I thought it meant a lot more to me than it did. And I think mm -hmm. what was almost disappointing is like when I finished, there was no moment where I was like, wow, this is amazing. What an achievement after such a hard year for you. It was, okay, what's next? You know? <laughs> and I thought that was, at, at first I took that as like a, wow, like you need to be a little bit easier on yourself because that's a pretty big accomplishment. But then I stepped back. I'm like, you know what? I'm really happy I have that attitude because now I'm thinking the marathon's done. Your credibility is there. I want to knock, I want to knock 45 minutes off my marathon time next year. I want to do like a 3.30 marathon, maybe even a little less. Um, and I'd eventually like to get below 310, 315 if possible, mm -hmm. um, which is going to be tough for sure. That's a, yeah. a really, really hard feat to achieve, but I think I could do it. Right. And I, I definitely, I, I'm satisfied. I'm, I'm never satisfied. Like I'm, I'm content, but I'm not satisfied. I think if that makes sense. And I think that's an attitude that's really driven me in a positive way, especially throughout my recovery. And I think it's something that I'm going to take on for the rest of my life. And it, it makes me really happy. I think that's the message that we should spread. To be honest with you, I agree. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I stood. I stood by that message as well. Like, yeah, you know, you should never be satisfied with it. You can always, always do better. Yeah, like, and that doesn't mean not being happy with your accomplishments and not no, taking time no. to smell the roses and celebrate. Exactly. Right? Be happy. Like, be proud of yourself when you do something difficult. But understand that that's not the pinnacle, right? No. Like, if if you hit that peak, like, what the hell are you living for, right? Exactly. I mean, you need to have some sort of new challenges in your life always, whether that's, you know, physical accomplishments, work goals, like educational goals, like all these things that you want to do, you need to be able to accomplish something, I think, to find some greater purpose and meaning in life. And for me, that was found through running um, and hit the ground running. But other people have totally different values, totally different purposes in life. And if they can find that, I think that's the most important thing an individual could ever do. Dude, can't even can't even state it better than that. <laughs> that was that was an amazing. One one more thing that I want to talk about before we talk yeah. about hit the ground running, yeah. um, is how bad actually was it? How how bad did it feel getting shot? <laughs> Not that bad. Not I, that I, bad. I think, huh? <laughs> yeah, I think people always like immediately are like, oh my god, like you got shot. Like that must be the worst feeling ever. It's like no, like <laughs> getting shot, it, like it, it's you you black out right. Like so like it's maybe the the most painful part of that entire night was probably like the mental pain of like the you know you don't know what's happening right yes. you don't know what's going on the physical pain is bearable i mean it everyone's got different pain thresholds so i i don't know other people might have different recollections of their experience than i did um but you have so much adrenaline you're you know you're so jacked up that you don't really notice the pain too too much like there's points when the tourniquet's been on my leg for an hour and a half the adrenaline's wearing off that it, it hurts for sure um the most painful part though was by far physio and it's not even close. Yep. Like we, we pushed so hard. Like there was days like my leg, like it was basically like this permanently. Like I couldn't move it. Like I couldn't, it was, oh, it was my. stuck. And like Frank would take it at physio and he would take it and just bend it all the way back to my, you know, my butt. I can't even do that now <laughs> just for perspective, but he would just push it that far when it was that stiff. And it was, and I don't, don't forget, I, I had bullet in my leg still at this point. So like, he's like pushing down on bullet fragment in my leg. There is full blown. I don't know what it, copper, whatever it is. He's pushing that shrapnel further into my leg while bending this thing back. So I've now got shrapnel piercing my skin and like my inside of my leg. Uh, everything's being stretched. It was by far the most pain I've ever had in my life, but it got me recovered way quicker. Right. Exactly. Um, so I think, you know, pain is pain, but I mean living is worth it <laughs> exactly <laughs> that that was actually good uh what did put actually what did push you to start uh hit the ground running yeah hit the ground running is something i i, I thought of the idea and the concept while i was in hospital um mm -hmm. and i think the biggest reason i did it uh, initially and i think the the reasoning kind of shifted but from the start the reason i started hit the ground running was i wanted to find some purpose for honestly maybe a little bit selfish um I wanted to find, I didn't know that I wanted to do exactly what I'm doing, but I wanted to find some purpose for going through what I'd been through. Right. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to find a way to give back, um, through my story and do something I think that could inspire some others. Like we talked about earlier. Yep. Um, and then I realized relatively early on into my recovery, there's not a lot of programs set up to, to help out people who've gone through these unique life altering traumas. Right. Exactly. You can sue the people involved in your situation, but like, I, how do you That's... sue people in a gang? Right. Like it's, <laughs> yeah really really complicated and it probably puts a target on your back that you really don't want right exactly um like i've stayed so far away from everything in my case i i don't know who's involved 
really I don't really exactly. know anything. I mean, like you purpose. got you got shot and you literally blacked out. So yeah, 100%. I don't think you can remember. But, you were telling me you yeah. weren't you didn't remember even what you did at the moment because yeah, it's like everything the, you know was from the cameras, right? Yeah, oh, hundred percent. Like and you know, I like there's I remember like bleeding out and certain things of that night yep. for sure. But like the instant, like I I've got very foggy memory. There's a few things I remember, but not that much. Um, but again, like, you know, I don't want any involvement. Like I, I want to stay as far out of this as I can. So you can't sue these guys. It's exactly. impossible. There used to be a program in place called the Ontario Victims Compensation Board, um, that entitled you to like up to, I want to say like $30,000 or something for your unique recovery processes cut by the government. Not, not, you know, not there anymore. No, whatever. Like I'm, I personally, I'm not a huge, like, I don't need the government to fund every aspect of someone's life. Mm -hmm. So I figured this is a niche. This is something that I have some um, you know, I like understanding of from going through it, but also a little bit of uh, what's the word like authority, I guess, like people yep. uh, credibility, I guess, in the space because I've gone through what I've went through. How can I make a difference, right? And I realized that for me, I was afforded this unbelievable luxury of free physio, exactly. and I had a lot of really good psychotherapists in my network who were helping me understand the more mental um, detriments of everything that I went through how can I make a difference? I can give back to the community and help these other kids who might be so unfortunate to go through what I went through, have the resources that I had to recover. Right. And that's why I started hit the grid. That was, that was why I went the direction I did with hit the ground running. I knew I wanted to do something to make a difference right off the bat. But once I realized how lucky I was to have the benefits that I did, and I saw my recovery going so much quicker than it otherwise would have because of these benefits, I wanted to figure out how I could get as many people as I could, the same opportunities that I did, right? And it's really cool to see it all coming to fruition now, um, you know, so soon after everything where I've got another kid who I can kind of mentor, right? And I can help through it. And I think he's doing really, really, really great. And nothing makes me happier than seeing everything come full circle where I've got this other kid, I really wish nothing bad had ever happened to him. But now I've got this other kid who's going through kind of the same struggle that I was going through off the bat, a lot of confusion, a lot of, you know, difficulty um physically mentally understanding everything that's going on and pushing through his rehab and he's killing it you know he's doing a great job and i think it's because of the team we set up for him the the resources we've been able to allocate and the entire network we've created man like it's it, it's so good to see everything so like there's multiple reasons why i started hit the ground running but the fundamental core purpose was established a few months in as i kind of realized how lucky i was and i, I want to keep keep doing that for as many people as i can Damn that's that's a hell of a hell of a good actually uh purpose to start hit yeah. the ground running um i want you to plug where uh where we can find you as well yeah yeah so at htgr canada um is our instagram and our tiktok so uh we try to post some updates on there we've been a little bit quiet on both those fronts since our virtual run um but we've got some cool stuff coming up i know i was talking to you about we might do a little yep. uh little podcast in the next uh couple months i, I think which would be really cool where we talk about to some we talk with some of like the trauma survivors who I've connected with um what's really cool I think too about like me being so open with my story is I've had so many people reach out to me who've gone through these similar crazy life-altering situations which can be anything right like I talked to a guy who got stabbed in the heart I talked to another guy who got shot I talked to a girl who had a really bad skiing accident that left her having like limited mobility in her hand like all these crazy different stories some of them might be super clickbait worthy. Some of them are just like really cool people who've gone through these tragic, tragic life altering situations. And you find some solace in talking with people who have like experiences and understand what you've been through. And I think it would really be really, really cool to open up a platform where I talk with some of these people about their unique response tools um, to get over their individual traumas and, and get through it and find some purpose in it. And I think it could be really beneficial for some people you know, who are a going through a really difficult time with mm -hmm. their own situations to hear some of these tools, not just from like a book or not just from like, you know, a clinical psychologist or whatever, which absolutely I want to talk with some of them, them on the show too, but some real, real people who've been through it and have exactly. their own lived experiences. I think it could offer a lot of benefit for people going through tough times and also just general people who are intrigued by these cool, crazy stories, right? I mean, exactly. you see the one minute TikTok video about some person going through this crazy car accident or something and it, it, it captures your attention. How it much can you say you. in one minute, right? Yeah. If you give a bigger platform and you can really dive into, I think like the emotional side of things and how much deeper it really is, I, I think it's a really cool opportunity 
to grow what we're doing and bring attention to everything. And it has like a big impact on people, to be honest with you. Like it doesn't like it doesn't even have to be people who actually who's been through trauma. Yeah. And it could be just a normal human being that is like going through something right now yeah. or is going to go through something. It just prepare them for this stuff, to yeah. be honest with you, hearing these stories. Yeah. Well, and I think it's inspiring too, right? And that's like, I, I know at the start I, I said that I, I, you know, I'm happy that it was a result of my circumstance that inspired you, but it wasn't necessarily my goal. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one kind of maybe mind, like shift of narratives that I've thought about in the last little bit where I went through a big phase where it's like, I don't want to be like a Tony Robbins. Like, I don't want to be this like crazy guy who's using his story to like inspire people and all this stuff. But I, I think I've kind of shifted on that where I've realized there's a lot of power in my unique recovery and, and what I've done. And if I can use that to, to motivate some people to find the tools in their own lives to become the best versions of themselves, that would be the best thing that I could ever do in my life, right? Exactly. Like nothing would ever make me happier than creating an, a, you know, an environment where everybody who follows the similar routines that I'm doing or similar things can thrive. Um, And I think that's a really, really cool luxury that I was afforded because of everything that I went through. And I think if I can do that, nothing would make me happier in this world. Amazing one. Just to end the the podcast with this question, this is the golden question of the season two. Okay. A bit of a cheesy one though. Okay. (laughs) Warning. (laughs) So if you ever, like your childhood version of you, if you were to look at, yourself right now would you say that you are the superhero that you wanted to become as a as a child is this is this everybody's getting this question or this everybody's is just getting this question <laughs> <laughs> i don't know man like i think i've definitely got a unique i think story that that could warrant me being in that conversation of being the mm-hmm. superhero to like a younger me um and i i think that younger me would probably be proud of the the adult version that i've, I've become but with that being said, like, I don't consider myself like a superhero or anything. I, I consider myself as a, a guy who's staying true to kind of his beliefs and, and you know, the values that he holds. Um, so I think a younger version of me, I, I'd like to hope would be proud of, of what I've been able to accomplish today. Uh, but at the same time, that, that little kid's got, got bigger things to worry about, I'm sure. So um, I, I definitely I wouldn't I wouldn't label myself as that. But I, I'd like to think that he'd be proud of, of what I've done for sure. An amazing way to end this podcast. Thank you very much, man. Hey, thanks Thank for having me Thank you for being on, here. Just I'll get you to plug where we can find you again. Yeah. At HT- yeah, at G-R. HTGR Canada. Um, you throw, throw in the bio too. But exactly. My, my oh, deep. yeah, of I course. It will, be on, it will be in the bio. <laughs> um, but yeah, HTGR Canada um, on TikTok and Instagram. And uh, Peacock underscore brand is my Instagram tag as well, I think. I'm a little bit more active on that platform, um, even though I need to be a little more active on the HTGR Canada <laughs> ones. So... Um, they're, they're both pretty active there. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for being here, man. Thanks for having me, man. It's good chat. Thank you. If you actually have watched the episode till the end, thank you very much for watching. Um, links are going to be in the description for my guests, uh, and, uh, HTGR Canada as well. Uh, you can find them on when you scroll down the description. And if you're actually listening to the podcast, thank you very much. You're the real ones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can check the podcast on other platforms such as uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Angami, Spotify, and you can check our social media as well. And you remember, check out Talk Lab. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>